How does an 83 years young retired school teacher and Valley resident have a tie to one of the most well-known female um, pilots of all time? I'm so happy to have you here today for my first episode of my podcast, Songbird Senior Stories. So today we're going to talk with someone who uh, taught for 50 years. She even applied to be the teacher in space back in the 80s. And she was the chapter, the Iowa chapter president of the 99s, which is a group of female pilots. Um, she continues her need for speed as she goes to car shows here in the Valley in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, driving her um, her car she named Blackie, which is a black Corvette. So I'm so excited to have Karen Hildreth with me today. And oh, there's one thing I forgot to mention. She's my mom. <laughs> so thank you for being here. I appreciate oh. it so much. And um, for starters, if, if you could share a little bit about uh, how you first, the, your first memories of, of just being fascinated by flying. Well, that's a very good question. And in honesty, I really can't think of a time when I wasn't interested in flying. Uh, one memory I have is uh, when uh, a small plane landed in our pasture. The pilot was having engine trouble, so he landed in our pasture. And, uh, and this is in small town this is Iowa. small town Iowa, mm -hmm. Rockwell City, Iowa. Rockwell City, Iowa, population, mm -hmm. who knows? 2,500. 2,500, yes. Is that, mm -hmm. yes. yes. Anyway, that was kind of unusual. So I went out and looked at the plane, and it took a while for them to get it fixed. And also, I had plenty of time to look it over. And, uh, and so that piqued my interest. Also, my Uncle Bill was a pilot, and uh, I loved him so much. So anything he did, I kind of wanted to emulate. In the high school, I, uh, of course, still continued my interest in, fly, interest in flying, and I applied f to be a, an airline hostess mm -hmm. uh, to several airlines to do, to do that job after I graduated. Mm -hmm. So you wanted well, to be a flight I attendant. I wanted to be a flight attendant. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't happen, but um, I did go ahead and um, learn to fly. Yes, and so if I could interject, um, I happen to know who taught her how to fly, and that was none other than my father, Dennis Hildreth. He taught her how to fly. So what was that experience like? I know he was a really well-known pilot and flight instructor in our town um, back when I was a kid. And that's true. He was not only a flight instructor, but he was an excellent flight in instructor. He, he was, had a passion for it. He never got bored with it. He um, imparted that to his students. Mm -hmm. um, he taught me to fly. I was, a very, I was not a confident student at first, but as I learned, I became more confident and mm -hmm. certainly enjoyed it yeah. and kept it up until I uh, received my uh, certificate, fly, fly, yes. flying license. And not only was my dad a flight instructor, but he taught aerobatics. Okay, so that's loops and rolls and all the maneuvers that you see when you're at an air show. So uh, growing up as a kid, I was always going to um, to air shows with both of my parents. So when you learned to do aerobatics, um, tell me a little bit about that experience. Did you enjoy it? Well, yes, I did. Um, first of all, let me back up just a little bit to say that um, he was a, a, a member of the International Aerobatics Club, mm -hmm. and he participated in air, sh in air um, contests mm -hmm. uh, uh, that demonstrated his knowledge of the maneuvers involved in flying, such as loops, rolls, hammerheads, uh, mm -hmm. various t things. Mm -hmm. I went along and... Um, and I helped out with the ground crew in the judging process of that. Yes. So um, then I learned more and uh, about flying. It was a whole different avenue. Yes, and if I recall correctly, I know that uh, not only did he have a, did you say routine? Is that what yes. you should call it? Like yes. maybe he would know that he was going to start out, um, you know, with a snap roll. You know, that's where the plane is kind of snapping around um, as it does a roll. Um, maybe there'd be loops. And not only that, but the pilots have to stay within sort of an invisible box. And if they go out of that box, then they're disqualified. And so you were part of the judging process for, for that, right? Yes, mm -hmm. it was. And it was very interesting to see um, all the different facets that were involved in that. Yes, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So you applied to be the teacher in space back in the 80s. So um, describe what that program was all about. Um, it was a program that was introduced during the Reagan years. The object of it was to get people interested in space, as students interested in space, mm -hmm. uh, and develop an interest in math and science and um, space exploration. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. So um, with that application process, um, as, a, as a kid, I remember, um, you know, not only did my mom work during the day as a teacher, but then I can just hear her pounding on her typewriter uh, back before the days of a uh, computers like we have today. But, you know, sometimes I'd look at my clock and it's like it'd be midnight and she's like tap, tap, tap. Because um, you had a lot of paperwork involved in uh, what you had to, um, up, you know, had to submit in your application. Do you recall what Oh, yes. It was a was? very lengthy process. Mm -hmm. I had to fill out many, many uh, pages of, of the application itself. I had to get endorsements from community leaders, my principal, various other uh, people in the area. Yeah, referrals, and I'm referrals, sure. Referrals, mm -hmm. yes. So then I submitted all that and waited anxiously to hear back. Did you think you had a pretty good chance? I thought I chance? had a good chance. Mm -hmm. After all, I was a teacher. Yes. I was interested in space, and I was a pilot. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't they choose me? Yes. Um, I was a, a little, uh, um, let's say, uh, disappointed, of course, that I wasn't chosen, mm -hmm. um, but I still continued my interest in space anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, I thought to myself, why didn't they choose me? Mm -hmm. I had a little bit of a sour grapes attitude, I'll have to admit. Yes, and I recall um, the day that we learned that the space shuttle fell out of the sky. and. Um, I just, it was really devastating to our family, you know, um, just thinking about um, Krista McAuliffe and, um, you know, the sacrifice she made and how brave she was um, to have moved forward and in, in being selected. And I do remember thinking that um, my mom had such a good chance. I thought, I also was surprised, like thinking, well, what are the chances? Like how many other teachers are there that are also pilots that also have such a passion? So, um, so you know, that is definitely, um, a, a memory, and I think that you know, just many, many people across the in the in the whole world were so saddened by that ex by by that explosion, and I think our family just had such a personal, you know, tie to all of that. So, That's true. Uh, so let's talk about the ninety nines. Um, first of all, can you describe um, a little bit about what that that group is all about? Well, the ninety nines is a, a group of women pilots. Um, and that it was established in 19, around 1929, 1930. It was a group of 99 women pilots, that's how it got the name, um, and their purpose was to further an interest in aviation and to support each other. Because in those times, women fly, flyers were a novelty. Mm -hmm. Men were reluctant to let us into their realm. Mm -hmm. At first, I At remember first, hearing that. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And so these gals supported each other and uh, were dedicated to uh, furthering aviation and education. I think of the groups that I belong to, you know, things I've um, enjoyed like photography or a hobby I've had in the past where, you know, you get together and you've got a love of, um, you know, either uh, hiking out here is popular or taking uh, pictures, but imagine a group of uh, female pilots. I mean, it's like, you, it is kind of a rare, it's not as rare these days, thank goodness, um, as it was maybe back in the 80s and especially back when the 99s first started. So. Yes, that's definitely true. Amelia Earhart was one of the uh, presidents, of, one of the first presidents of the 99s. Mm -hmm. And so she, uh, of course, was, a well-known flyer, mm -hmm. but there were some others in that group also who had made great contributions to flying, to women fly flyers, mm -hmm. pilots. Describe your experience being the president of the 99s. Well, um, I was chapter chairman, which is the same as president. Um, we um, met once a month and um, we had several different projects that we worked on. We painted compass roses on uh, airport runways. Uh, we flew um, 
daffodils in support of the Easter, I believe it was the Easter seals. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they there sold those for charities. Charity. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not only was there a chapter chairman, but we also had um, the country was divided up into sections of approximately six or seven states, perhaps. So you'd be in the Midwest. We'd be the Midwest. Section. North Central chapter was ours. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, we met once a month, and then once a year we would go to a section meeting, and that was uh, that was very interesting. What I didn't realize at the time, I considered it kind of an honor to be elected president, but also I didn't realize that I also was had inherited the job of planning the next section meeting. Mm -hmm. And that was the first year, right? That was the first year. That you were president. It was a very <laughs> big job. Mm -hmm. What were some of your roles? Um, just your tasks you had to get done when all of the neighboring um, 99s would come into your state? Well, not only did we need to arrange speakers, um, tours, but also uh, many of them brought their husbands and children along. So we had to plan uh, events that they would be interested in and as the well. hotels and the hotels meals yes so to be like being an event planner suddenly for this huge group oh, of people exactly. right exactly <laughs> and it was it was very time consuming at the time I was also uh, teaching I was working mm -hmm. and trying to maintain a, a household with two mm -hmm. children and yes and mm -hmm. so it was it was quite interesting mm -hmm. you had a lot on your plate at I had time. a lot on my I plate that's that. right but it was it was a lot of fun. Um, our uh, group was very helpful. But I do recall being very relieved when the last plane in that group took a taxi down the runway. <laughs> you were like, bye-bye. Like, <laughs> like that was the end. So uh, you had some really interesting friends, other uh, pilots that you flew with. Or yes, knew. I um, certainly did. Tell us about a few of them. Well, one that uh, comes to mind was a, a a friend who had participated in the Powder Puff Derby. That was an event that was held in, um, I think in the early 30s. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, women pilots started out from a, uh, from a location and flew usually uh, across the country uh, to a destination. And was it a race? It was a race. Mm -hmm. Along the way, they had to you know, touch down at certain waypoints and they had to uh, meet certain qualifications. Many of them took along their own meteorologists so that they could predict the weather along the route. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine um, a big group of female pilots uh, and they would have their own meteorologists to help them kind of navigate the weather conditions across the whole country. And then they're having to land in various states, right, that are expecting them. That's right. And then refuel, I suppose, and eat, mm -hmm. right? And then go back up in the air and, and bounce in across well, the country that way. Well, and unfortunately, there were some fatalities mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. because they, you know, they were determined to win. They wanted to get, you know, points. That's an amazing um that's history right there. It and, is. And just think one of your members was, was, uh, was in that. In that. That's yes. right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And there again, it was an opportunity for the women to have a chance to fly because there were other air races, but many times they were limited to the men. Yes. Wow. Describe why uh, Atchison, uh, Kansas is significant. Well, Atchison, Kansas, let me tell you, it's a small, t uh, relatively small town, maybe medium-sized town, uh, just near the Missouri River. And uh, they once a year they have they celebrate Amelia Earhart's birthday because it's her birthplace. Birthplace, but the birthday her birthday is in uh, late July, so this town has a celebration each year, and they have you know it's a carnival atmosphere, various events going on, things for kids to do, and families come. And uh, the thing that I was most interested in was the tour of her of Amelia Earhart's birthplace. Um, so uh, we were we were there, and the the docents were leading us around, and um, I happened to meet up with Muriel Earhart Morrissey. She was the younger sister of Amelia. She was quite elderly at the time, very frail. I could barely hear her when she, when I talked to her, but she was able to answer some questions. And one question I asked her was, "What do you think actually happened to Amelia?" Because as you probably have, as you probably have heard, 
the um, the stories were running rampant. You know, she was kidnapped by natives, and mm -hmm. or she faked dying, and so that she could um, just have no longer be famous or something. There were all these, you know, yes, all these rumors. Yes. So, but Muriel's answer to my question was, she went down in the ocean and drowned. She was very matter of fact about it. I know you have a book here and... And it's called Pilot and Pearls. Uh, and I um, was able to uh, ask Muriel uh, Earhart Morrissey if she would autograph it. And she gladly did. And she inscribed it to Karen, Muriel er Earhart Morrissey, Amelia's sister, July 19th, 1986. And I treasure that. Mm -hmm. How amazing to have this. Oh, my goodness. Now, you had an event that took place um, when you were on your way down there uh, with one of your friends that you happened to be flying with um, yes. for this event, right? Yes. So describe what happened. <laughs> All right. We, we took off from a small country airstrip. It wasn't an airport. It was a grass field. And uh, so we took off in a small uh, Cessna 150. And um, this grass field didn't have... Uh, gas. They didn't have uh, gas availability. So the point was that we were going to stop and get gas on the way to Atchison, Kansas, where we were going to celebrate the birthday of Amelia. We uh, flew, were flying along, and in the meantime, we had a strong headwind causing us to use a lot of gas. And so I kept saying, do you think we should stop and get gas somewhere? And she kept saying, oh, we'll be okay. Let's just go a little bit further. Well, we were approaching the runway in Bethany, Missouri. And I thought, oh, thank goodness. So I thought we would be able to get gas there and no worries from then on. So we started down on the um, downwind leg, which is parallel to the runway. And uh, as we were flying along, the engine stopped. Propeller was right in front of our eyes. Uh, my heart was right here. I'm sure. Because uh, how many times have we been in our cars and we're like, oh my gosh, we're, where's the next gas station? Well, imagine being in the air and having this happen. I know. <laughs> uh, my friend was a good pilot and she said, don't worry, I had the field ma made, meaning that she was going to be able to land without incident. So we, um, we flew along and then as we turned uh, on the base base leg of the of the pattern uh, the plane took off uh, the the plane the engine took off again uh, because it was fed by gravity and so then we had a little bit of gas and I do mean a little bit <laughs> we started um, down on the final approach and um, we and there again the engine quit luckily we were able to glide to the gas pumps and uh, I have heard of of uh, cotton mouth which you get when you're very scared. And I remember just not saying anything for a long time. <laughs> but all was well. We continued on our flight and went on down to Atchison, Kansas. And to this day, my best, very good friend, um, and I relive that story many times. Still kind of laugh about it, don't we you? We laugh about it now. And the interesting thing is my dad had also taught her how to fly. And uh, one thing when you're you're learning to fly um, that a good instructor will do is purposely have the uh, shut off the engine, right? That's and right. so you pretty much coast down. I mean, it's ideal in ideal conditions that you can coast down. And as long as there's somewhere to land, like a, a road or even a cornfield. Yes. Uh -huh, which Not, I, well, a cornfield, depending. It's kind of bumpy, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> another story. Not the best place. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But uh, so you'd had some training on, on oh. that. And he was uh, he was adamant about training, uh, teaching people to do those. Yeah, uh, was it? they could save their lives, mm -hmm. and um, and that was a real benefit to do that. So, I have always uh, liked to do something for you for your birthday that is memorable because growing up, um, my mom's birthday was always January second, and for those of you who have birthdays around the holidays. Um, it's often like, you know, you don't really get a much of a celebration, right? Because everybody's uh, got Christmas on the mind, right? So um, I always, I know that you had said that 
people would say, oh, here's a present on Christmas and open that for your birthday later. So, And my mother did make a cake and we had a small celebration, but sure, nothing big. So, but lately um, I've done a couple of things that I was hoping would be a little bit more memorable for you. So would you oh, like to describe? Sure. <laughs> First of all, Heather is one of the most thoughtful people I know. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> and How lucky she, am I? <laughs> when she gives a gift, it's not just something she runs out and buys at the last minute. She puts a lot of thought into it. And a couple of examples would be, for my 80th birthday, she planned a trip to the Grand Canyon and we would ride the mules. So they were the retired mules. So we didn't go all the way down like they used to do, you know, go all the way down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. But I had heard about the retired mules went around the edge of the canyon just for three hours, maybe three, four oh, hours. Yes. So I arranged for that. It was an awesome experience. Not only Heather and I went along, but also my two grandchildren, Skylar and Sierra Smith. And uh, we had a wonderful time there. And then for my 82nd birthday, I didn't know what could top the Grand Canyon trip, but she managed to uh, contact a, a pilot and, uh, and, and arranged for a pilot and a plane uh, for me to just refresh my flying skills. I hadn't flown for probably 20, 25 years um, in a small plane. Yes, and I had sought out a uh, local female pilot and the funny thing is, I had made the call and I said, oh, you know, what are some of the things that she can see when she's up in the air again? And, and she had mentioned, well, you can go to Canyon Lake, right? Mm, and or Roosevelt Lake. Over Roosevelt Lake. And so she had given me an app um, before they took off and said, well, here's, you know, it's got, I've got the plane in here and then you can track where we, where we go. Well, I was looking at my app on my phone as I was sitting there having lunch waiting for you guys. And I just saw this oval. And I just thought, well, this must be broken. Why would she want to go around and around and around like in an oval and not see some of these sites that she had promised? So explain why I was seeing that oval. Well, I uh, asked the flight instructor if we could do touch and goes. And she said, certainly. So what we did, and the reason I wanted to do those, and touch and goes, by the way, are just as the name implies, it's a chance to do uh, Land, takeoffs and landings, which are the base, I would say, the basic uh, elements of flight. If you can take off a plane and land a plane safely. Yeah, so you, you pretty, wanted that challenge. I wanted that challenge. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see how much of it I remembered. Amazingly, I did remember quite a bit of it. And um, there was a lot I didn't remember, but it was a great challenge. And I enjoyed that so much. It was a great day. So when you had your flight, your most recent flight, the instructor was interested to see your um, your flight log here. And of course, here's the decathlon uh, that you owned, um, that we, you did aerobatics in. And uh, I know that she had made a comment, she couldn't believe that your first flight was in 1971. <laughs> and keep in mind, she was a, a young 20-somethings pilot and probably thought, you know, that's a piece of history way back in time. <laughs> But she signed it, and it, it's very important. All these things are very important to me. So um, when it came to flying, um, you know, you see a lot of different things when you're in the air. And I know a lot of people uh, have flown, uh, you know, often commercial um, flights, and um, it's always amazing the things you see. But in a smaller plane, I'm sure that you had opportunities to see things not everybody sees. What were some of those experiences Well, and like? that's true. Number one, you're lower to the lower than you would be in a commercial plane. Mm -hmm. And so you're able to get up close, uh, closer. And some of the things I remember seeing would be uh, wild turkeys grazing in a snowy field. Isn't that, uh, and that was back in Iowa, right? That was right? back in Iowa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, deer in the eating grass in the forest. Mm -hmm. uh, and the clouds. Farm, farm fields. Farm fields. The yeah. farm fields. Mm -hmm. um, the clouds the fluffy whipped cream type clouds that you would see. Mm -hmm. And flying in and out of them, right? I was not able to fly in and out of them because I'm not allowed to as a private pilot, but 
but my flight instructor, my <laughs> yeah, that's my, husband, my my dad would teach. Uh, he'd give an instrument rating, it was called, and so that means people would learn to fly when uh, they couldn't see their. They they had to go by the instruments by the instruments only. And so I know that you flew a lot with him through the yes, through the clouds. Yes, so, I did. Yes, and that was a that was a, a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that there's a poem that um, means a lot to you, and so. In closing, uh, would you mind reading it to us? Oh, I would be glad to. The name of the poem is High Flight, and it's by John Gillespie McGee, Jr. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the wind-swept heights with easy grace, where never lark nor even eagle flew. And while with Silent, lifting mind, I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand, and touched the face of God. It's beautiful. Gosh. Yes, and you tear up just because you can relate to it so I much. Can. And I think that any pilot probably can relate much more than those of us who didn't learn to fly. So thank you for sharing this with, with us it's today. It's been my pleasure. Yes. So this was so inspirational today. And... Uh, I just love the fact that that you were able to share your story, and I know that um, that it's just inspiring to me. It's really in inspiring to people of all ages. You know, it doesn't matter that you know. I mean, I guess in a way, it, it's just people like the '99s, especially the early ones. They really had to pave the way for uh, flying to be open to people of um, you know whether you're you know a man or a woman and it should not matter at all right well, so the plane doesn't know the difference that's, <laughs> that's what i always sure. think <laughs> that's for sure so um, i was truly inspired by this story and i hope you all were too and thank you